Hello, everyone. I'm Ted Oakley, Managing Partner at Oxbow. And today I'm happy to have John Hathaway, who is Managing Partner at Sprott, Senior Portfolio Manager at Sprott Asset Management. And I will say on a personal note, I think John is as knowledgeable about gold as anybody I know in the country. And I think everyone would probably agree with me on that. But John, I'm happy to have you today. Ted, thanks for that very flattering introduction. And I'm really, I'm happy to share my thoughts with yeah. your with your um, your base. Well, you've been at it a long time. And so uh, yeah. that helps a lot. Maybe too long. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I want to start out with a couple of things. You know, everybody's got the Fed on their mind. And I think, the, I personally think they make a mistake here by lowering rates and just cranking inflation back up again. But we're seeing inflation everywhere. You have a, a pretty good graph really on the consecutive quarters now of union wage um, acceleration. And I'm not trying to, you know, not trying to pull them out as, but they are one example of where we're getting inflation everywhere just about now. Uh, and uh, speak to that if you would. And, 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 the, and the second thing is, when you speak to that about how you show how gold stocks really perform well when they're cu cutting these rates. Sure. Uh, on the Fed, I think the obsession with the Fed is misplaced as if that were the key to what gold is going to do. And I can come back to that. But uh, that's all we hear on the, in the financial media is what, you know, what's the Fed's next move. Um, it does have some relevance, but it's just not nearly even 10% of the total story. Um, as far as uh, return on capital, uh, the industry has been through a 10 year period where um, two things have happened. One is the gold price has been lackluster. It really only broke out from a, let's call it a 10 year range at the beginning of this year. So gold prices have really in the greater scheme of things, not really done much. And secondly, the industry has been building new capacity uh, and not getting any return on it. So uh, no, it's no wonder that uh, the returns on capital have been, have been lackluster uh, at best. So I think that's all changed. And, and that's why I think the gold stocks right now are compelling. Uh, but I'm sure we'll, get into that as we go along. Well, you mentioned uh, in this in your slide that says how they outperform, the stocks outperform during the rate cycle cutting. And you have three periods there uh, through 01, 08, through 220. Uh, and it looks it looks like they do, they really do well during those periods. The gold stocks. They not only do well, but they outperform gold. So gold, benefits from uh, a Fed rate cutting cycle. That was true in, uh, at the, uh, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. Uh, it was true uh, during COVID when the balance sheet, the Fed balance sheet ballooned and so forth. Uh, but in, in, in that, and there was one other instance, I think, following um, the dot-com crash, <coughs> Fed rate cutting. Uh, was very, very beneficial for gold and uh, even more so for gold stocks. <coughs> well, let's talk about that supply. You have a great graph on gold buying by central banks and how it's reached an all-time you know, all high. Uh, it's a super graph. It goes back to 1950. But this is looks like the largest year ever. This is by far. I mean, they've, they've been buying gold... Um, not just China, but uh, all the BRIC nations. Um, and, and you sort of wonder, say, well, well why is that? Um, one of the big reasons <clears throat> is they're trying to get away from the US dollar. Uh, they are beginning to sell trade balances in <clears throat> local currencies, whether it's RMB or rubles or rupia, whatever you name it. And then, uh, you know, what isn't settled in in, in uh, local currencies is settled in gold. <laughs> so it used, I, I would say, excuse me, I've got a, I'm just getting over this cough, but um, they are, um, uh, 
circumventing the U.S. dollar. And I, I like to think of it, and I'm not original on this, but I think uh, Zoltan Pozar, who you, who you know and who uh, we both met at the same conference, calls it the dusk of the petrodollar. And what that's very important. And that's why I think this obsession with the Fed is, is a little bit misplaced because I think the, the bigger story is, is the, the lack of um, potential buying from foreign uh, official sector and also foreign uh, entities um, for U.S. treasuries, which used to serve as a way to park trade surpluses. And you got a decent interest rate and uh, somewhere down the road when you needed to activate it and liquidate for whatever reason, it was still there. That, that, uh, that trust in the dollar as a reserve currency expressed in the form of <coughs> use of uh, U.S. treasuries as a way to park trade surpluses is going away. And it's going away at the same time that our budget deficits and the issuance of treasuries, and there was just an article in the journal over the weekend about how our issuance is, is exploding on the upside. <laughs> so what it, what it suggests to me is that uh, the rubber is gonna meet the road somewhere, and in my mind, maybe this year, where supply and demand just can't meet at, a, at an interest rate that our financial markets will find acceptable. And so, you know, in my mind, somewhere out there, and I know you've talked about this a lot in a lot of different venues and, and ways, is the, act, the financial accident that could be out there. And I think it may, may be all linked to this real mismatch between dollar issuance, tra uh, uh, treasury bond issuance, and, and the lack of interest from traditional buyers outside of the U.S. So let's, let's wait and see how this, this all plays out. But that, I think, is that, that story has not yet been talked about, and we haven't really seen it play out. But uh, we've seen gold start to trade at record highs with any, without anything like that in the news. You know, John, uh, one of the things, too, is if you look at foreign buying of the Treasury, it's it's at actually just a tiny bit lower level now than it was in 2017, seven years ago. All, right. And that's in the other extra 16, 17, 18 trillion that was issued was all by, by the U.S. Pensions, individuals, and, and we're sort of becoming like Japan <laughs> to buy, you know, buy our own debt. That's right. Yeah, we're actually changing the rules. Uh, the most recent change that interested me, and it was uh, pointed out by Luke Roman, um, that uh, the traditional leverage required for holding, this is for commercial banks, for holding treasuries has been removed. So there's actually no margin required. So, you know, it's a free lunch. You, you know, just load, load your balance sheet up with these, these really crappy assets and and see what happens. Well, the other thing that talking about the price in the foreigners buying here is that you have a great uh, graph on annual gold production, which has been flat, which is interesting. One of the big, one of the big things about Bitcoin is there's only a certain amount of Bitcoin, which there is, but gold is becoming a little like that as well, because right. you don't have enough to go around right now. Well, there, at, at a price, there won't be enough to go around. I mean, that's price discovery, and we haven't really seen it yet. But, um, yeah, uh, supply of gold has flattened out, probably because the, the economics for producing it haven't been all that great for quite a while. And uh, so we are going to see a slowdown in CapEx. We already are seeing that. So, yeah, the supply is going down. Uh, the above-ground supply, which everybody talks about, kind of a myth really, uh, because so much of the gold, you know, you hear this way too much, at least I do, uh, that all the gold has ever been mined is above ground. Well, that's true, but like 80% of it is kind of like in the form of uh, roofing for temples in India and, uh, or jewelry of, you know, 
made by Tiffany. It's not marketable. So it's not available to um, meet margin calls when they occur. Yeah, and the um, which comes down to this with the gold miners, you have a great slide on talking about their cost of production, which is really enlightening. And that if you look at 24 and 25 years, uh, it's quite low rel relative to really all of those. Well, it is. I mean, uh, the margin, the cash margin on producing gold is uh, is pretty robust. Uh, but uh, in a way, the, the 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 mining business, the gold mining business, has been running on a treadmill, kind of staying in place because while uh, costs have been uh, sort of creeping up, and while the gold price has been basically stagnant until this year, there's been kind of a margin squeeze that doesn't pop out from that chart. But what's worth bringing up is that, and, and, and by the way, it's, it's not the gold price that everybody pays attention to on Bloomberg or CNBC. It's kind of the average gold price year by year. Um, and uh, that's gone up over the last 10 years by about uh, 20%. Uh, last year, the average gold price was, I believe, $1,940, something like that. Um, this year, in the first quarter, the average gold price is uh, closer to $2,100. And on a year-over-year -year basis, I'm throwing out two numbers. I don't want to sound too confusing. Year-over-year, uh, -year, the gold price is up $200. So that's about 10%. That's a huge amount. When you're talking about uh, leverage, a leveraged business that's just kind of been eking out enough cash flow to stay in business, but not enough to really reinvest in the business or, you know, really ramp up dividends or buy back stock, which is what they should be doing and which they're starting to do. And and you have another follow up than that about the reserves by the top ten gold mining stocks. And they've gone from like uh, 590 to 395. Uh, and so that's even been a tougher thing because, you know, you, you have less and less of it, I, I suppose, for them to, to sell. That's right. Uh, the the, the, the um, reserve life has declined steadily, as, as that chart shows. Um, and... Uh, the industry is gun shy about spending money on big new mines that cost billions and billions of dollars and wreck their balance sheet. So um, I think we're in a kind of a sweet spot for gold miners where they're kind of like um, addicts that are kind of in rehab and uh, they've had this binge of spending uh, and uh, it's really hurt, hurt them. So now they're kind of like, uh, born again, and uh, we'll probably go through a couple of years where they just hold the hold the the line on big new capex, and they're going to be gushing cash flow, and all kinds of good things can happen from that. Well, and you know, uh, you have a slide that I borrowed from you before, and I want to borrow it again. Feel uh, free. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's gold versus the S B five hundred for twenty five for the twenty five years ended in 2023 and it's interesting it beat everything there s p the total return with dividends the s p index uh it was i thought it was a it's a it's a great look at gold and uh i don't think don't you think the average person doesn't realize that well ted we should keep that a secret among ourselves <laughs> <laughs> well no I, you're right i mean I, it, absolutely uh because and, and here no, it's 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 perplexing, but most people in our part of the world, I'm talking about the U.S. and probably Europe, so so Western capital markets are so uh, caught up in technology investing and mainstream investing, and you know AI and and the Mag Seven. I mean, you've said a lot about this, so I'm not gonna. I don't add much by talking about it. But uh, that has resulted in just basic, like, who needs gold? Who cares? You know, it's at a new high. But, you know, look at my, 
Look at my NVIDIA. I'm just doing great. Uh, that's, that's probably why there hasn't been a lot of interest in, in gold and why if somebody were, if, if you were to bring this to somebody's attention, they'd say, well, so what? And I kind of think that's where we are. And it will only uh, mean something and, 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 and maybe make more headlines than it has so far is if their NVIDIA and their Tesla and their Microsoft and you name it, uh, start to underperform. So I'm looking for that to happen. I'm not wishing anybody ill, but it just, to me, it's the only way I can explain the lack of interest in, in, in what we've just, what you've just pointed out, which is that gold has outperformed everything in the universe uh, for the last 25 years. And, you know, that chart isn't updated for what's happened this year. Well, and I was going to say this too, uh, you know, you've got a, a, another great graph on with, with that in mind, a goals percent share of global equity and bond securities. And obviously we're way behind where we were in the seventies and er, in mid eighties. And, uh, it looks as though, and you know, this too, I know, Nobody owns this stuff. In fact, I saw a, a right. look last week of uh, registered investment advisors, and gosh, I met sixty percent of them, maybe sixty-five, had no gold exposure whatsoever, zero. Yeah, because and you know why? Because they they have alternate exposure in private equity. Yeah, which okay. is the next the next uh, bomb to drop. Yeah. Uh, uh, so yeah, they're uh, so yeah, they're alternative assets non-diversified, uh, non-uncorrelated private equity. So, you know, uh, you know, you know, I know I, I've seen your rant on that and I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> well, I say this, John, because I've talked to institutions and, and larger and individual investors that have private equity. And I've asked them the direct question, what do you own? Can you tell me what you own? I've yet to get a good answer actually. I've yet to get any answers on investing, like you know, return on capital, debt to equity, no, no information. And so it's interesting to me that that particular part of the business, which has become popular for every MBA that's come out of school the last seven or eight years, um, they if you actually ask the people invested in, in general, okay, not 100%, but in general, they can't tell you what they own. And that's why the private equity thing, I think you're better off in gold sometimes than private equity. Yeah, don't look behind the curtain in private equity. Yeah, for sure. So, I, the other, the, And that brings to mind this, um, you have a graph about gold mining equities versus the gold price. And, if you, and I remember this, but back in 11, 2011 and 12, those price to cash flows were huge. They were like, some of them are like 30 or 40 times. Right. And they made less money, than, but now their price to cash flows are low. And you can tell it by this graph because you show the gold price and then you show the equities, but they really have some room to catch up. The, the, the potential for mean reversion, which is the sort of jargon people like to use, is huge, which is sounds Trumpian, but <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, it's, it, it is not hard to find uh, good companies in the gold mining space trading at price to cash flows of uh, five, six times and pr free cash flow yields in high single digits or low double digits. So eight to call it 13, and they're outliers in, in maybe 15, 16% free cash flow yields on, um, on adjusted market cap. Um, I can't, I started as a value guy back in the 1970s. And when you saw that combination of valuation and, um, and free cash generation, that was a, that was, that was a formula that almost always resulted in great returns on investment for you as a shareholder. So that's where we are today in the gold mining space. Well, you know, at Oxbow, we have three strategies, but two of the strategies, we have gold, bullion, and miners. And it's interesting, if I go back to the graph you show, the 25-year graph, 
people, I think, I want your opinion on this, but it seems to me that people don't understand how to do this. But if you own gold, you need to be, just own it and not try to figure out the ups and downs. I'm going to catch $100 either way. But if you really want to own gold, it's a long, it's something you put in, you leave it. You know, you, you go long term with it and you don't, right. you don't have to bet the farm on it. But whatever you're going to own, you need to own it. You know, do you, do you see it that way? Absolutely. I mean, it's not something that you, it's not to me, the people that saying the same thing, people that try to trade it outsmart themselves. Um, and there are too many people in the blogosphere and, you know, in the finan our financial business that look at it that way. And, and they, and they make it seem as if you can really do well by using clever technical analysis to, um, uh, you know, scalp the highs and, you know, buy back at, 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 at intermediate lows and all that kind of thing. But it's a complete waste of time, in my opinion, when you think about the fact that gold, um, as we have said already, has outperformed everything, not for the, just the last 25 years, but you can go right back to 1970 when Nixon closed the gold window. And, and um, so, yeah, I think it's just, it's a, comp if you're, if you're a wealthy person, it's a, it's an important diversifier. It's a, it's a, it should be a core position. And I'm not saying it should be 20%, but it should be somewhere between five and 10%. And then when you go back to the graph you talked about, about the weighting of gold in investment advisory firms, I guess that was the universe you were talking about. It's 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 not even close to one percent, or maybe that's where it is. Well, a lot of them are many of them, many many of them are zero. And uh, one of the things that people, I'll just give an example. People ask us at Oxbow about okay, I I, I want to buy some Bitcoin. I want to buy some Bitcoin, and I'll say to them, okay, why don't you just buy two percent and forget it? Just put it back, okay? If it's going to do what you know all the pundits think, then you'll be fine. Just put 2% and forget it. But if you tell them, look, buy 5% or 6% in gold and just forget it, you know, <laughs> they don't look at it the same way. It's really right. hard to get that across. But I think that's the way people should look at it. And that's why I show that graph twice, because that's where it is. And I, um, but that's a good thing I want to close up on here. You're talking about to the, to the individual. If you were saying, okay, like we own probably 6% and two of the strategies, but if you look at it uh, and you were giving advice to somebody that didn't have it at all in a portfolio, you know, larger investor, how would you spread spread it between the bullion? Because uh, Sprout, Sprout has a gold, what is it, uh, your, your, your physical gold um, ETF. How would you spread it between the physical and and the miners as far as, say, it's 6%? Okay. Well, first of all, I'd say that, that physical gold is a safe asset. It's better than U.S. Treasury. So think of it that way. It's a risk diversifier. Um, it's always liquid. Um, yeah, you can make a mistake by paying too much and buying it, you know, in the heat of, a, of, of an upward move. But if you if you sort of uh, think of it as, as a patient kind of investment, and it's not really something to be traded it's a it's a, it's a reserve asset so that should be the bulk of your precious metal exposures exposure why you would own mining stocks it's more tactical and you would think of it more as a way to enhance um, a macroeconomic view which is one that i believe in and and, and uh, not but not too many people do is that the dollar uh, is is losing value before our eyes, and it's only the kind of magicians on Bloomberg and CNBC who kind of keep keep us in blinders of what's going on. But but anybody, if you take a step back, think about it. Tangible assets in general have gone up. Why? Because the dollar. It's not that they're going up. It's that the the currency in which they're priced has lost value. And the same thing with stocks. Uh, yeah, it's wonderful that stocks are going up, but they're really good. It's an illusion that they're, 
I mean, I'm not saying that wealth isn't created and that you can't invest in a good new idea that's going to make a lot of money. But in terms of broad investment categories for pension funds, for family offices, for wealth preservation, um, what's happening is loss of value in which our investments are quoted. So, and that's fine. I mean, you know, not a big deal, but it's what's going on. And, and so gold of all those things is not correlated to the other things in which your um, financial assets are quoted. And so you have diversification. And the other important thing you have is liquidity. You can sell gold on, in, in a minute. Um, you might not be able to sell your favorite investment in a minute because it might be underwater. Or you might not want to sell it because you have unrealized uh, gains. So uh, gold is is it has a function. It's a it's a safe asset. It's safer than U.S. Treasuries, and gold mining stocks <coughs> are more speculative. But for I'd say uh, those um, investors who want to capture the alpha that they can provide, and there are many ways that they do that. They're a good place to be, but I would I would I would not. Of that 6%, I would say maybe no more than a third or a quarter. Of miners. Uh, in miners, yes. Miners, yeah. And that's sort of the way we look at it. And it's interesting, if you look at the graph, I'll bring you back the graph that you show of mining equities, the gold price. All you would have to do, the way you look at it, is kind of follow that. And when you get these exaggerations in the mining prices relative to the price of gold, that's the one you cut back. You wouldn't cut back on the bullion. That's right. Right. Yeah. So yeah, here we are relative to uh, the gold price. The miners have never been cheaper. Yeah. Right now. Lots of ways to show that. Yeah. And um, we that's what we say. And, and it's interesting uh, talking about the dollar. I, I had an investor almost call me anti-American because what I was saying was, look, <laughs> you don't realize this, but one of the things that's happening right now is you're starting to have larger forces outside the U.S. that are going to come critically large versus us. Then there's you can see them all, you know, China, Russia, India, yeah, you name it. and yeah. and that that in itself is makes setting it up so that the dollar eventually has to have a hard time because they keep moving. People are not noticing this, but they're moving, moving, moving away from the dollar and the only people buying the dollar are us. And so what happens to us when the dollar keeps going down at some point, and one of the ways to offset that, and I'm asking this question, is to own the gold. That's that's a perfectly uh, logical way to put it. And uh, uh, again, it's a diversifier. Um, it does not lose value against paper currencies. We can show that any paper currency uh, over time has lost value relative to gold. <clears throat> gold is a real asset that's liquid. Um, and um, too much talk is given to sort of the negative, uh, pessimistic view that's attributed to people who champion gold. Um, and I think there are a lot of people in the gold camp that are guilty of that. But to me, it's kind of matter of fact, like how do you protect capital over time? Um, I mean, it's not controversial to say uh, our budget deficits are out of control. It's not controversial to say that our politicians are uh, corrupt uh, in terms of their um, commitment to um, monetary stability. Uh, none of those things, everybody kind of agrees with that. So what do you do about it? Well, sure, you own you own a house, you own farmland, you own real assets to produce cash, you own stocks. Um, and, and within that mix, wouldn't you like to have something that's uncorrelated to that so that if something hits the fan, uh, we know that gold does well in uh, uh, counter cyclically in periods of market stress. So, you know, if you need to back up the truck to buy the S and P at six times earnings, I'm just making this up. Wouldn't it be nice to have something that had appreciated 
for whatever reason in that sequence. And that's that's where gold makes sense. Well, and the other side of it is if just 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 take 99 and 2000, for example, and look at what you would have had to pay in gold to buy, to buy a piece of property, say a house. Um, and then if you look at that today, it would have stayed up enough to where you could buy that same house, you know, and with the same amount of gold today. Right. That's that's the key to this thing. You have to understand. I tell everybody the the main source, the main reason to invest is to protect buying power. That that's the whole game. That's that's what we're talking about. <laughs> and and I, you know, everybody should just kind of divide their the market value of their portfolio, or maybe the uh, presumed market value of of your house. Divide that by the gold price, and 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 do that today and then do it by the gold price 10 years ago or 20 years ago and see where you stand. Well, I know, uh, I know, you know, like our friend Grant Williams always talks about the fact he owns a lot of gold bullion and that he says, you know, one of these days a real estate price is going to break in Australia and that, and I'll, I'll be using just a little bit of my gold then to, you know, buy it. He's got That's a right. point. Buy a, exactly. Buy a, nice house, a nice house on the coast and surf for the rest of his life, using just a smidgen of his gold. And so uh, I, I really appreciate, we, uh, we're, we're two or three times during this, or three or four times, we're, we've shown the website for Sprott. Gosh, Sprott has so many gold ways to uh, attract gold. And is that the best place for investors to go look and see what you do? Yes, yes. Thanks for mentioning it. Yeah. So go to the Sprout website. There are multiple ways to to invest in gold, whether it's um, closed end trust, or by the way, if you want physical redemption, you can do it. And the gold is stored at the uh, Canadian Mint. Couldn't be safer than that. Um, so uh, that's one way, uh, but there are others. And we of course have um, uh, ETFs, uh, the track gold miners and what I do, kind of old fashioned, active management. Um, there are still a few of us who believe that that we have a better mind than AI and we can pick stock winners. And, uh, you know, hopefully that'll be proven over the next uh, next year. Well, you know, what we say at Oxbow is we really feel like the next 10 years is going to be more inflation will it be a straight line no but it'll be up and down and it'll be a situation where you you do the 60 40 you know and forget it will not work during this period you're, you're going to have to have more real assets you're going to have to know when to trade the stock side and i, I still believe that's where we are right now yeah i think that's right i mean i think it's another way of saying and probably better me say it than you is that bonds are no longer a safe asset um and that's because of uh, the fiscal position of the United States, which we've talked about. And secondly, it's because foreign central banks and foreign investors see it. They're not dummies. They can see that, that uh, our fiscal house is not in order. So they don't want it. So the only way we're going to finance the budget deficits is by forcing pension funds and banks and money market funds to invest in this stuff. Um, and, you know, it's kind of a charade, but um, um, it is uh, hard to hard to in that in that scenario, especially with inflation being resistant to all of this uh, nonsense that the Fed is, you know, is, is in control of things. Um, uh, there has to be a better way. And, uh, you know, it. it I think, you know, cycles take long time and the wheel keeps turning. But I believe that that 1% you talked about in terms of gold exposure will certainly revert to maybe maybe 2 or 3%. Uh, it'll be a combination of money flows and appreciation. Yeah, I think so, too. Well, listen, you've been very kind to give us your time. I know a lot of people are looking for you. Because uh, you're uh, you're as knowledgeable as anybody I know in the fields, and so I want to thank you for spending the time with us today, John. Thanks, Ted. Appreciate it. Yeah, and we hopefully we can get you back next year. Well, I'm I'm happy to do it. All right. I, I never lack for opinion. 
<laughs> all right. We'll see you again. Thank you. Okay. All the best. Bye-bye. Hello, everyone. I just want to say, if you like this video and you want to see more of this type of information, because we really try to get the information that you don't see from anybody else, then be sure and click on subscribe and you'll see more of what we do here at Oxbow.